Yeah, I guess so. Wow. To feel more protected in Brooklyn, biking around, you would like more protected bike lanes, right? We'd like to see less cars on the street, more bike boulevards, and super blocks around schools and parks. More safe bike lanes so that our children can ride on their own. More safe bike lanes. I need more protected bike lanes. Me too. A bike park in the city for sure, where we can safely park our bike. And also, we need less trash in the bike lane. I'd like to see more open streets near schools. I I would love to see more awareness around cycling rules and safety. I'd love to see mopeds out of the bike lane. They're scary. Keep the bike lanes clear of trash. Biking is my main mode of transportation in the city, and I think that having more protected bike lanes would help me get around more safely. I'd like to see a more thoughtful e bike policy here at Brooklyn's Prospect Park. <laughs> Yes, cars! Yeah. Right, when I say who bikes Brooklyn, we say families bike Brooklyn, and we'll do that three times. Who bikes Brooklyn? Families bike Brooklyn! Who bikes Brooklyn? Families bike Brooklyn! Who bikes Brooklyn? Families bike Brooklyn! <laughs> um, good evening, my name is Kathy, and I'm the proud and proud to be the Brooklyn Organizer for Transportation Alternative. Yeah. Welcome to our Families Bike Brooklyn uh, panel, a conversation about the needs and future of families that bike in Brooklyn. Judging by this awesome crowd, you can see a lot of people care deeply about making family biking safe. Thank you to our friends at Brooklyn Public Library for hosting us, our moderator and panelists, our speakers, TA staff and volunteers, our board members, advisory council, um, everyone who's listed in the program. And most importantly, our Brooklyn activists who fight for safe streets in Brooklyn every day. <laughs> First up, please welcome David Wallace, Executive Vice President of External Affairs at Brooklyn Public Library. Thank you, Kathy. Um, on behalf of my colleagues here at the library, um, we're just thrilled to, to welcome you here to the Dweck Center, to Central Library, and it's great. Um, after a couple of years of the pandemic to see folks coming back and to see this room almost full, and it's probably gonna be full um, within a few minutes. Um, and uh, I gotta say, Kathy, what a great job pulling this, pulling this together, and what an amazing panel. Looking forward to hearing from them. I actually used to work at the Department of Transportation before coming to EPL, um, and it's great to see folks who've really been in the trenches for years and years working on, working on these issues, um, working to promote biking, um, to make our borough safer um, and to make the city safer, safer for cycling. Um, it's particularly appropriate for the library to host a discussion like this. We are part of the public realm, and we're a free, safe, and welcoming space for everybody. Everybody should feel comfortable walking through these doors, and similarly, our streets should be the same. In public space where everyone should feel comfortable, where we're all protected, where we all feel safe, um, particularly our children as they're walking and uh, as they're biking. So as much progress has been made in 
recent years, there's still a lot more that can be done to improve the cycling experience here in Brooklyn. And uh, we're just really excited here at BPL to host this discussion and looking forward to hearing uh, everything that gets talked about tonight. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here. And let's get on with the show. Thank you. Now I'm pleased to welcome to this stage a council member who has declared that street safety is her office's number one priority, District 39 Council Member Shahana Hadid. Can we give a big round of applause to Kathy for a discussion and I'm really interested in what our panelists have to share. I want to first just acknowledge and say her name, Sarah Schick, uh, was killed by a box truck driver in my district in Gowanus along the 9th Street, very dangerous 9th Street corridor. And so this has been the, the issue of street safety, cyclist safety, pedestrian safety, has, of course is on my mind every single day, as Kathy mentioned, that this is the the single most issue that FISA, our constituent services director, that we hear about as an office on any given day. And, uh, and as a result of that, we've been meeting with Brooklyn Commissioner Keith Bray on a monthly basis and dedicated last week's monthly meeting with Senator Bernardis and Assemblywoman Joanne Simon um, to discuss the short and long-term plans for the 9th Street corridor. I am pushing for a protected bike lane. I'm pushing for a corridor-wide, an aggressive corridor-wide safety plan, and really look forward to working in close collaboration with the DOT, with uh, Transportation Alternatives, and all other stakeholders, including Katie from Principles. Uh, <laughs> Uh, about two hours ago in the coffee shop, which is adjacent to where uh, the death occurred. And so um, really looking forward to our upcoming, on Friday we're doing a walkthrough, which may become a bike-through <laughs> tour of this corridor and really experience um, directly uh, just how dangerous this corridor has been and that we expeditiously need improvements um, immediately. Um, many of you might know I am a lupus survivor, and so uh, riding through Brooklyn has never been easy. Um, I don't cycle, and when I do cycle, I do so with groups, and so I was really proud to join uh, uh, TA's family ride in Prospect Park, where I uh, had just recently uh, gotten my left hip replaced for the second time um, as a lupus survivor and decided that if I'm going to do this, i got to use an e-bike. And the city bike, e-bike, the new fleet really made it easy. But of course, um, you might know that uh, e-bikes are banned in Prospect Park. And so together with, uh, right, <laughs> that should really upset everybody. Together with council members, uh, Leah Joseph and Crystal Hudson, uh, we wrote a letter before the end of 2022 um, asking, Commissioner Donahue of Parks uh, to present us with a policy that is thoughtful um, and looks out for the safety of e-bike users. We know that e-bike users are families. We know that there was an incident when uh, a cargo bike, a family on a cargo bike was about to get ticketed $150 for riding through uh, Prospect Park and your advocacy helped prevent that. But it brought awareness to the fact that e-bikes are not permitted in Prospect Park. Um, and that this also impacts delivery workers. So many of our immigrant workforce utilize uh, delivery to get food delivered to us. And they've been tagged as essential workers and it's only right that we come up with a thoughtful policy um, that really addresses these needs. And so I'm gonna continue to push to make sure that e-bikes are not banned from Prospect Park, but that we are utilizing a policy that is inclusive of all riders in the park. And that is, that is gonna need to include signage um, and lighting and all sorts of mechanisms to improve the way we ride um, in Prospect Park. Um, and I'll just end by saying that we're also working closely with the DOT. They've got programs set up to uh, bring awareness to our delivery worker community 
um, on their rights and, and safety uh, protocols. And so in district, uh, we are about to begin some sessions with delivery workers. We've got a huge workforce of Bangladeshi and Latinx workers who live in the district, and I'm making a commitment to making sure that uh, these workers know their rights and that we're advocating for more for uh, this, this sector of workers. Um, and lastly, you know, Denver has modeled uh, a rebate, an e-bike rebate program that's been successful. And at the state level, we've got Assemblymember Bobby Carroll and Senator Julia Salazar um, who've got legislation that would bring us a, 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 a rebate program for e-bikes, 50% off on bikes, $1,100 or less. And I support that. I'm looking forward to seeing what the council could do. But um, you can count on me for working towards a, a rebate program similar to Denver. And I, I noticed uh, that Washington, D.C. council members are also looking to implement a program there. So this is good policy. This works. We've got to do everything in our power to reduce our carbon emission and acknowledge that um, electric micro mobility is the future of the city. Um, so let's do everything in our power to make sure that it's safe, that no one is dying, no more traffic fatalities, and um, that this is the future of New York City. Thank you all so much. And we'll come forward to you. Thank you. The letter we sent to Commissioner Donahue is at the table, at the TA table outside if you want a copy of it, um, and also uh, my business card. So if you want to get in touch, I uh, want to make sure that you have my Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Council Member. Um, next up is our Brooklyn's youngest cycling advocate, uh, Kaide Nardi is an 11-year-old sixth grader, and she has been biking to school since she was in the third grade. Please welcome Kaide Nardi. <laughs>
And so um, I am in the wonderful process of watching freedom, as many of you, if there are children in here, there are other parents. But you know, when you watch your child crawl the first time, when you watch them take the first step, and now my oldest is sort of at that stage where I'm letting go of the bicycle as we ride around in the park. And I feel so incredibly fortunate to be in this role and to work with all of you to advocate for safe bike infrastructure. And it breaks my heart every day that when I take this beautiful child of mine and I put her in the park, I know that she can't ride further than the secure gates of the parking of the uh, of the park in her house. And this is the reality of so many children in New York City is that we give our children this these first incredible breaths of freedom to crawl, to walk, to bike. And then unfortunately the city can't meet that invitation for our children to be able to ride and experience that freedom in the city. I don't know how many of you have the opportunity to grow up in a place where you can ride your bike, but just what an incredible gift that is to give to our children. And it's not only that they can go and experience the city, but that the air that they breathe is, is cleaner, it's that they can get away from video games, it's that they can go and sort of experience this wonderful place and meet other people. And so that's what it is that we're trying to do, is ultimately when we create streets for people, and especially for our most vulnerable, when we create them for children, it makes it better for absolutely everybody. I can assure you that when a city works for children, for a six-year-old who wants to ride a bike, it works when you are 80 and you may have trouble walking. It works when you have limited abilities. It works for the most vulnerable among us. And so that is our goal, and that is what we will strive every day to make happen. And I'm so honored to be with all of you. And again, Kathy. I mean, Kathy deserves it. Before I step down, if you are a, a staff member of TA, can you put your hand up so we can recognize you as well? Come join us. We gather in quiet moments like this. We gather to yell, but we always gather to move the city forward. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so Said here, here. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, about, I had an idea about having a robust discussion centering family biking, something I hadn't heard of, about in this kind of forum. Um, and I, he, his ex enthusiasm matched mine. And I think my next question was, would you moderate the panel? <laughs> And yes, and since then we've worked hand in hand to create this program with an all-star lineup to advocate for safer streets in Brooklyn. Thank you, Ryan, for your partnership. And I uh, thank you for going down to the oh, Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. All right, here we go with the moderation portion. Hopefully the mics are turned on. Have they turned on? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, first off, thank you, Kathy. Like to say partnership, you know, you ever hear of a 95, 5% partnership? I'm the 5% and about 50% of the credit, so thank you for <laughs> organizing. Um, and it's already been a wonderful evening, so I feel like I could just wrap up and we can yeah. go, right? Uh, but, but, uh, so uh, I'm Ryan Russo. Um, I am having the privilege of moderating tonight's panel, and I did spend a number of years at the New York City Department of Transportation working uh, to develop the city's city's bike network and um, just a bit there was a, there was a moment that that this event makes me think of when we uh, uh, developed the first parking protected bike lane like the ones that were only in Europe on the other side of the park cars on Ninth Avenue between 23rd Street and 16th Street in 2007. Uh, we, we, we put that in the ground, it was sort of mind-blowing. I went out to take pictures of the users, right, in Manhattan, and a parent, presumably, came biking down the street, side street, and turned onto the 9th Avenue Park Protected Bike Lane, and trailing her was about a seven-year-old girl yeah. on a bicycle in Manhattan on a street. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was like discovering like a species that didn't exist <laughs> in, in the wild. And it, it really, I, I snapped that picture standing on a scaffolding, and it was I showed everyone immediately, put it in every PowerPoint that we had, because the power that family cycling has is really um, exponentially different than, sorry to say, like single dudes in their 20s who grew up in Ohio and came here for an accounting job. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyways, so this, you really, this is, this is really a tremendous moment, and I think we have the exponential ability to build momentum around this really important movement at this point in time, um, you know, because of a few things. One, you know, e-bikes. We, we heard the council member talk about e-bikes, um, the, the widespread proliferation of different varieties of bicycles with electric assist. Uh, allowing families to bring not just their children, but their children and their groceries along with them. To make cycling that much more useful to a family is, uh, this moment is, is, is tremendous uh, that we need to take advantage of, and other cities are. Um, and you know, ultimately, you, know, you don't hear politicians give speeches about how they want to help that single person. They always want to help families. And if families are cycling, people will notice the momentum will build. And so it's a tremendous moment, we're really excited, and we're hoping with this panel, we, we chart a course, we get some specific actions that we can get to, to, to work together on, whether that's advocates, whether that's you and your community, whether that's government, our elected officials, our agency leaders, so that we can all work together to provide the safe streets that we need. So let's get uh, into it, and we do have quite an amazing panel. Your programs have uh, our panelists' bios. I will read the, the whole bio, I'll give a quick, quick intro, and then we'll get into it. We do have a closing time at the library, so I will give brief introductions for our panelists. First, I'd like to welcome our borough president, Antonio Reynoso. Antonio, as you know, uh, borough president Reynoso, born and raised with his two sisters in South Williamsburg to Dominican immigrants. He's a progressive leader, but we all know that progressive leaders can be progressive on everything but transportation sometimes. Uh, Antonio has been progressive on everything and transportation from the beginning. We've seen his leadership around cycling, around public transit, around pedestrian safety. He lives in Williamsburg and is qualified for this panel because of his uh, two sons, age two and five, and we have a wide variety of ages here. Um, second, I'd like to introduce uh, Sheba Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, she is a ride leader for the East Brooklyn Bike Club and a mother of two boys who are 12 and 14. Um, and uh, Sheba is really passionate about representing underrepresented communities uh, in the cycling community. And we all know that the Brooklyn Bike Network has not developed evenly. The East Brooklyn Bike Club was established in May 2022 to provide access for cycling for members of the East Brooklyn community. She was also a member of several bike clubs. I've never claimed several bike clubs. Good company bike club, the Century Good. Plus crew, MBR Cycling, and if I love them now, let me know. Thank you for joining us. We also have with us Emily Stutz. Yeah, Emily. Uh, Emily's a special education teacher at CS372. She has experience planning the physical bike education program for her school community, including Bike to School Day, on her own. It's not like with the DOT, DOE program. It's a collaborative opportunity, though. <laughs> <laughs> with, with incredible leadership from you. And then, I love this, you know, we, 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 if you're on Bike Twitter, we all know about bike buses. I, I lived in Oakland the last five years. We had a bike bus. Cities have bike bus buses, but Brooklyn has a bike train. <laughs> Emily has organized the Bergen bike train uh, on Wednesday morning, so kids and families from all over Brooklyn can, can bike to school safely. Um, thank you for joining us, Emily. And then we have Chief of Staff Ryan Lynn, Chief of Staff of the New York City Department. He is Chief of Staff and Commissioner Donis Rodriguez, and before joining New York City DOT, he was Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations for Mayor Eric Adams and Chief of Staff to then Borough President Adams. 
And you might not know that Ryan has been a transportation advocate who's an associate director at Tri-State Transportation yeah. Campaign, which has the unenviable task of trying to get places like where I grew up, Mineola, Long Island, and suburban New Jersey, to like invest in transit, walking, and biking. So he's fought <laughs> some tough fights and has a son age eight and a daughter age five. Did I get that right? Um, so thank you to our panel. We're, the way, what we're gonna do is we have a few questions that I'll, I'll ask, we'll go around, and then um, uh, TA is collecting cards of questions that you have. So we'll also have some questions from the audience and then we'll have a lightning round. So here's how I want to start. So um, so many of us love check biking because it's, it's so joyful, right? It's just a, it, and it, it has so many benefits and we advocate for it because we think, you know, it'll do everything to save the planet, save people money, um, you know, uh, save you time, convenience, you know, you don't have to wait for the bus. There's so many benefits, but family biking in particular, let's, let's bring out like what really has brought you to family cycling? Why are you passionate about it? What, why do you think that, um, you know, we should be talking about this, this issue? Uh, and if you were advocating to a family that doesn't bike, what would you say is um, uh, why they should think about getting on? What are the, the top benefits for you? So let's start, uh, with, with our borough president uh, to kick us off. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so happy to be here at the UW. Uh, Brooklyn, I love you. Uh, so I, I want to be honest. I think um, it would be great to have a bike network in which we can feel comfortable and safe and being able to travel with our families, but for too many, uh, it's not the case. While I am an avid bike rider and care deeply about cycling, my wife, not so much. Uh, she thinks it's the best sense. Right? She's like, I don't want you on this. Uh, get a car. Get a car. Get a driver. I had my first year as a borough president and had no driver. Um, and you were a borough hall. And that's a very difficult thing to do at first. I was out to Coney Island, to Canarsie, on my bike or on train. And I, I want to get my kids involved. I want to put them in the back. Of a bike and take them to school and so forth. My wife just won't allow it. So I have a, a long term goal here. It's to convince her that the streets are safe enough for our kids to be on a bike with me. And uh, you know, my wife is somebody that pays attention to things and it's not somebody that's uh, a boy, this is foreign to, but for her in Winnipeg, in Winnipeg, which has an expansive bike network, probably arguably one of the best bike networks in all of Brooklyn, uh, she still feels it's not safe. Um, so I, alongside the Department of Transportation, the folks here in this room, uh, want to have that conversation about how we can eventually feel safe enough that we don't need to worry about our kids' lives when we try to take them to school um, and other places. So I do want to say that I'm part of a group trying to make that happen. Yeah. yeah. So why? Why, why bike? Why, why do your kids bike? Why do you bike? Why, why even? Or different bike clubs. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um I actually started cycling with my kids in during COVID. Um, the parks I don't know if you remember during quarantine a lot of the parks closed. Um, and my main priority was health, so vitamins, activity, especially given that they were staying home um, for much of the day, um, every day. <laughs> so. We got, I got a folding bike and they already had bikes and we would ride the mile to the nearest open park so they could play at the park and then ride back. Um, and I remember I had considered getting a bike like years before and having a wagon in the back with them and I was just terrified. I had looked at all of the different bikes and all the different bikes and I was terrified to ride on New York City streets myself. So the idea of bringing my kids out there just felt like we're all gonna die. <laughs> so um, during COVID, the streets were quieter, they were safer, and we got into that habit of biking. And I started biking on my own and kind of fell in love with the idea of discovering different parts of the city that I had never seen before, that I didn't know existed, um, and that looked completely different. Um, and I want that for my kids. I also want them to, to be more active, uh, especially after COVID. Um, having been online for school and socializing for about a year and a half, 
um, trying to get them back outside and get them active uh, and doing something that I love we can do together. Awesome. The, the togetherness is uh, one, of, one of my top, top benefits. Emily, how about you? You're, you're organizing in, in your schools, the, the, the Bergen uh, bike training. Like, why? What, 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 why do you think more people should bike? Why are you doing this? I mean, I think, you know, for me, it's really just seeing kids be able to use their, their bodies and their voices uh, and feel empowered. Uh, and when, you know, when you're biking with kids, you can really see that. Uh, Kylie, my stepdaughter, she's 15. She just learned to ride last summer. Um, and, you know, when she was learning, there was a point where, uh, you know, she didn't want to learn so much at that point. She's a teen. She doesn't want to hear it. Uh, and she was told by the instructor to, you know, go one, two, three, glide, and then scream at the top of her lungs. She's a really quiet kid. But being on the bike gave her that sense that she could really do that. She could scream at the top of her lungs. She could experience that freedom. And I think that can, the bike is a tool that can do that. Seeing in the Bergen bike train, you know, seeing kids from four years old biking themselves four miles to get to school, you know, that's something that can only happen with a bike. And as terrifying as it is sometimes to see her out there, we wouldn't want it any other way. I wouldn't want it any other way. She, if she wants to do that and she can, she should be allowed to do that. She should have a space where she can. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, Ryan, um, you know, you personally have been biking with your children, and now you have this opportunity to sort of you know, be part of a uh, city agency. Why, why does the New York City DOT believe that getting more families on bikes uh, is good for, good for the borough? It's not just because the borough is good city, so you know, citywide approach to this. Um, but it's important because if you're looking at children riding a, a, a bicycle, the I would always view them as indicator species of a healthy bike network. So getting more, more and more people out of their cars into sustainable modes of transportation um, is not only good for the environment, it's good for the economy, and it's good for mobility in our in our city. It's good for public safety. It's good for a whole host of different things. I got into transportation because I felt like it was a linchpin for everything around it. Education, uh, housing, um, public safety, um, economic development, all these different things are a linchpin for uh, transportation is a linchpin for that. But being able to be in an agency that actually you walk down the street and you're like, oh, I, put, I helped get that bike lane done. So that, so that child can bike to school, or that my wife can bike to the Monterey's Hospital, where she's a midwife, that's which how she gets around. Or a child can feel empowered and confident um, to ride uh, in their neighborhood. I, the best feeling I've ever had in my entire life was watching my son take off by himself on a bike and literally jump off and just jump up in his air and scream out loud, I did it, I did it, I did it. It's really a confidence booster. For, for our young people, mm -hmm. so improving our cycling network allows them to do that in a real, in a real meaningful way. So, you know, I get to go to work every day, and I get to, to help advance that little by little in every neighborhood and, and across the city. Awesome, awesome. So that's the positive. We've got to shift a little bit to, to the barriers. So like, why isn't this happening? Why isn't every family? And I have to leave now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is called the hot seat for Ryan. Um, <laughs> Personally, it, it was as someone who built a lot of the bike lanes. It's kind of Oakland, where I lived the last five years, was quite quiet streets, and my kids could bike on, on many of them in a lot of different places. And they've actually lost some independence in coming back to Brooklyn, and that's that's eating at me. And it means the city has to do more. It means that there's too many cars. And and you know, as much as we want to promote, we know that your partner is not necessarily irrational, and we, we should mention, like the council member did, that Sarah Schick was struck and killed just this, you know, last week, and I, I, I get nauseous thinking about parents, uh, children losing their parents, someone I don't even know, and it's just, it's an unimaginable horror, and none of us want to see that happen, so, the, and not enough of us feel safe out there to do this, so, 
What other specific needs for families cycling on our streets, the kinds of streets that you've seen maybe in your travels, maybe in one neighborhood, that, that there should be more of? So Emily, you're, you're leading many children biking on one street. Like you, you know, you talk to them. What, what kind of street would they see? Is it you know, to put the bike lanes? Is there a wider bike lane? You know, with your wand, what should we be doing in Brooklyn? I think a lot of kids just want to see fewer cars on the street. I mean, when you look at the scale of cars, it's not a fair fight uh, in any way. And so kids want. Kids want things like slip and slide and spaces where they can bike and place, places where they can play in the street. Um, and I think that that would be a beautiful way forward. Yeah, so like bike boulevard concepts where you know cars are severely restricted except for local access. I should have mentioned in the intro remarks that one of the reasons why this is a great moment is you know the pandemic with open streets has really shown the way more people walking and biking, and I think got a lot of people onto the mode, bike sales exploded, um, and you know, light traffic streets were, were a big reason why people were comfortable, and unfortunately we're kind of back and in, in away from those, those light traffic uh, streets. Uh, Shiva, how about you, you know, you, you bike in East New York, and now you're discovering different neighborhoods, I know you, you kind of observed some disparities in different neighborhoods, you know, talk about what you'd like to see and even where you'd like to see it. Yeah, I think um, similarly, when I bike with my children, it's about space. A lot of times even when I bike on um, bike lanes, the amount of space that's been allotted to the lane is not wide enough um, to avoid car doors opening and cars on the street. Um, and sometimes my kids are even scared to bike on bike lanes. And there have definitely been times where we've had to, I've had to kind of take the lane of traffic to make sure that my kids are safe as we're riding together. and. Um, a big challenge with that is that a lot of drivers don't know the rules for cycling. They don't know that we can take a lane if it's not safe, and they don't know sometimes even that I'm supposed to be on the street <laughs> and not on the sidewalk. Um, so I think that's a big part of too, is the um, awareness of drivers, um, but also just having more space for our adults and children. Awesome. Is there, in, in, in the neighborhoods that you ride, is there a particular place and space you can could come from? Is it like, you know, there are parked cars everywhere, double parked cars, you can make the traffic, what do you got? Um, we've got double parked cars, but I specifically am thinking about Saratoga Avenue. Um, it's a two lane street and there's not really enough space even for two lanes of traffic. Um, and biking on Saratoga is the challenge for me. But with my kids, I always just take a whole lane. Um, but that, that feels very scary, I think, for me and for them. Yeah. Well, I'll just say that's the that that is the safest thing to do. You know, taking that lane, you've got that right to the lane. Unfortunately, not everyone is aware that you have the right to the lane, and our motorists don't uh, don't necessarily give give the space that you should have when, when you do take it. Okay, so now here we have our policymakers, you know, who have you know some power and authority to help us get there. Um, you know, the borough president's office, you know, has been a champion. I know, I'm sure you hear people say we should never do congestion pricing and you know, your office has been changing congestion pricing, bicycling, sustainable transportation, you know, how can you take things to the next level in, in your advocacy uh, so that more families in Brooklyn can can choose this mode? So I think the, the first thing we need to do is be comfortable, or the city needs to be comfortable, with just taking over streets, complete streets, um, and uh, normalizing that, right? Uh, we have the West Side Highway in, the, in Manhattan, that's north to south, and I think it's the most used uh, bike lane in the entire country. Uh, and it's because it's safe, it's because it's dedicated, but that's north to south. Do we have a dedicated street that goes east to west of Manhattan, for example? I mean, we don't have that. Right? And if we're serious about uh, cycling and moving people away from the dependence on vehicles, we need to show people that have vehicles that, we take, that we're taking this infrastructure seriously and do bold things, not just things that are friendly. <laughs> we even had conversations with the council member on taking over Bedford Avenue and turning it into a pedestrian bike lane, or Beverly Street, and turning the whole thing into a, uh, a bus lane, bike lane, uh, and a pedestrian, uh, mm -hmm. like Fulton Street, uh, without any cars coming up to right. We've had those conversations, and they just don't move, right? When we have 
in this incremental movement of adding one mile at a time or you know half a mile at a time. That's just not gonna convince people that are not cyclists that we we take it serious. It's almost like a burden on the Department of Transportation of the city to have to add these bikes. We have to be mandated to do 20 miles a year. Oh, where are we gonna find this? Instead of it being a real plan where we can actually commit to it and do it boldly, just take over streets is the first, is what I think we should be doing. And um, I'm here with uh, Commissioner Keith Brace here, um, and he always tells me we need all the political power that we can to make sure we can make this happen and so on here because they struggle with it. And I get up issues, I do meet reports, and give the Department of Transportation a hard time. So what I've been doing is I've been very particular about who's on the community board. And we've added the most amount of cyclists in the community board this last year to the new board. It is if, if we added a question, do, how do you move around this city? And you know, putting cycling would, would help you out. So one, <laughs> our point here, put that you're a part of TA, put that you're a cyclist on your application, and that will help you become a community board member in Brooklyn. So we're also so systematically also making sure that we're going to So I said two things. I got your back. You do something bold in Brooklyn, I will have your back. I'll explain to you what you got. And uh, community board, making sure that I appoint folks that understand cycling, mm -hmm. understand um, that we gotta take care of pedestrians first, um, and cars last. So that's the thing. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Ryan, my fellow Ryan, um, you know, New York City DOT, we know um, such a great team working so hard trying to get the bike lanes on the ground. Um, specifically to families, you know, um, you know, how can we, what kinds of streets, What's in the toolbox? What are we What are we seeing? What can we do? Uh, what's DOT doing to get to get this really rolling? Yeah, and I I, I want to note that you know the borough president says I got your back, and he actually stands up and says you have your back. You know, you, 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 you know we came out to Emmons Avenue, put out two two miles of second bike lane. That was not an easy project. <laughs> <laughs> The guy leading the, the charge on the, on the and all the bike rides was for President Williams. So you know it's it's really important to highlight you know that that it's not just just not verbal. It's he's actually out there on the ground, hitting the ground running with us. So uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. And before I get to the remiss, so you just mentioned Keith, the Borough Commissioner Keith Ray. So I want to give him a shout out. And Tim Wiley Shorts, our Assistant Commissioner of Education, uh, is here as well as both our press people, um, making that sound like needed. Um, so, uh, but in terms of what you're still talking about, what we want to do as an agency, um, we want to be bold, but we do need the political political support in order to make those things happen. Um, we will continue to, to be innovative and, 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 and uh, aggressive in ensuring that our streets are safe. Um, we're trying to do that with bike boulevards, with protected bike lanes. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, during the, when I was with the borough president, uh, the other borough president. Um, you know, bike superhighways, identifying locations for bike superhighways. Is a, we currently have a federal grant uh, that we apply for to try to, to see if we can um, look at Conduit Boulevard to, to actually, you know, see what that we could do to reconnect the community through Conduit Boulevard and Queens. But there's different ways, you know, the bike boulevards, the, the 34th Avenue project in Queens connects five different schools along it. It's, a, it's the premier project uh, of open streets in the city. And we want to do that everywhere. We're trying to push protected bike lanes uh, to get over the finish line in East New York uh, this year, so we'd love to have your your voice and support in those. So it's really about you know using the toolbox that we have that we know works and deploying it equitably across the city. And that's that's we know how to get it done. It's a matter of pushing the projects forward, getting them uh, with with community uh, and elected official voices there to support. Awesome. I want to just stay on here a little bit, like. This is a choir. We're preaching to it, right? <laughs> it's just needs to be said. And we all know how hard it is when we get out in you know a broader conversation. Um, and I think you know we we hear a lot, but we would all everybody agrees it seems to be better if there were less cars. But Brooklynites right now with the pandemic, whether that's 
concerns of, 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 of catching disease in public transit, concern of your personal security, concern that it's not going to be reliable. Brooklynites have bought more cars. They're, they're in the streets, and they're what's keeping people from feeling safe uh, to, get, to getting out there. We've got congestion pricing coming, coming along, but ultimately, kind of the less cars, we know it would be helpful, but there are people who believe in their day-to-day -day lives that they've made a rational decision. And once they've made that sort of purchase and, and choice, it, 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 it's there. So how, is there more we can do? Can we be more sophisticated in the conversation? Is there, can we be more clear? Like it's easy, to, you know, we can say, we can throw out the red meat here, but like how do we really have that tough conversation maybe in an empathetic and compassionate way with our constituents so that we can keep the buses moving, keep the bikes safe? Uh, or President, do you have any thoughts on that? They did make a good decision because the city supports that type of purchase, right? It's like, oh, you bought a car? This is the best city for it. So we're going to help you out. We're going to let you run through bus lanes. You can double park on bike lanes. You're going to be you know, terrific of having a car in this city. It's amazing. So why not purchase a car? We have to move away from that. And the way to do that is by just really building out spaces that make it so that they feel more comfortable. And I'm not saying uncomfortable in purchasing a vehicle. It's just that they don't own everything. Like this culture, uh, this bike, the uh, car culture, we start breaking it by showing people where they are allowed to be and where they're not allowed to be. The reason I got inspired to do anything related to this, I had a car, a really nice car that I liked when I was younger. I had a 2006 Infiniti G35 Coupe. <laughs> so I thought I was the coolest kid on the block. <laughs> then I went to a kid's ride club uh, from Woodhall Hospital. Mm -hmm. with Dr. Fish kids, and we're taking these kids around, and they had a, an annual kids' summit, bike summit, and they brought Enrique Peña Rosa, who was the mayor of Bogota, mm -hmm. and what he did is first he towed all the cars. He just towed every single car, and he almost got assassinated by them. <laughs> <laughs> but he towed all, all the cars, and then after that, he built a bus network, and what he did is that he blocked it off, so there was protected bus lanes. And, when, and he had traffic at a standstill. If you had a car at a standstill, these buses are driving, he said specifically 70, 80, and 90 miles an hour. He was like, I want them fast, and I want them moving. And anybody that's sitting in the car, is sitting in the car, seeing these buses just fly by, it's like, oh, this is not a place where you should have a car. Mm -hmm. And this bus is right there moving this quickly. And I just feel like until uh, car drivers don't see that, they're not gonna move out. Right now, you move faster than a bus in a car. It's easy, absolutely. There's some parking that prevents the bus from taking the bus lane. And so we're gonna start building dedicated spaces for everything outside the vehicles. It is a good and smart decision for somebody to have a car in New York. And that is an unfortunate thing, mm -hmm. but it is a reality. This city is built for them, not for us. And we need to start changing that. Thank you. So there's the push. Now a little bit more on the pull into into this this mode and this, this movement. So there's, we need safe streets, it's like the baseline. I mean, we don't have a hole that people need to feel safe. It's like, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. There's a, there are other barriers that people experience here. One you know, is that, you know, if it's family biking, it might need to be e-biking. My kids got too heavy for my extra cycle, you know, with just my legs, and I needed an electric assist bike. But those were running five thousand dollars, and you know, there's folks who, you know, spend their five thousand dollars, they need a car, and they don't have another five thousand sitting around for for an e-bike. There's where you park it, and worrying about it getting stolen. There's will the police, if you register it, you know, will it be found if it if it's stolen? There's there's the gear you, you have to wear. Um, there's the gear for the kids, keeping the kids dry and wet. Um, uh, you know, the fact that we have a lot of walk-ups. So let's talk about some of the other barriers and what we could maybe do about them. You know, we heard about uh, uh, Denver and other cities that are getting on in, in the game of, of, of subsidies. Um, let's just hear from all our panels. Then let's start with you. You know, what, do you, what, what barriers do you think we really need to address and any ideas for addressing them other than our street design? Yeah, I mean, a big obvious one is the is e-bike the e subsidy. Um, we ended up buying an e-bike and then sold our car. Uh, right afterwards, we did have a car in Brooklyn because it was super convenient to have a car in Brooklyn. Uh, but buying the e-bike was a total car replacement, and a, but a subsidy would have helped us immensely. Like our e-bike went on my credit card, and then paid it off over time. Like a car 
our payment plan. Uh, but I also think having those safe places to park, I think especially like an easy win is putting up more like bike parking at schools so that when kids can bike with their families, they can bike more independently and then they have somewhere to put their bikes once they get there. So many schools don't have any bike parking. How can we expect for kids to bike themselves? And then it puts less of the burden on the parents. Yeah. Awesome. Makes a lot of sense. Shiva, how about you? You know, what, what, what barriers, what are the top barriers, you know, that, that stand in the way from we take more folks in that you know uh, getting on bikes? Um, I would say the cost of cycling in general, the cost of the bikes, the gear, all of that. And when you have a family, it becomes more than just the cost for yourself. You now have to buy for two, three, four um, family members in order to ride together. Um, so that is, I think, a big barrier for a lot of people. Awesome. And uh, Ryan, you know, what, what do you hear in, or around? What do you, what do you say that New Yorkers uh, need in addition to safely designed streets to get more folks on? more families on bikes. So I think the first and foremost is the safety on streets, but secure bike parking is one of the things that we prioritized last year uh, at the DOT. Uh, I think we for the record number of uh, daylighting uh, intersections with with, um, with bike racks. So uh, we're going to continue to lean into that and really lean into um, you know expanding secure bike parking across the city. It's something that we're going to do. Um, you know I think the the additional items that you know talk a little bit about e-bikes, but you know, the cost of the e-bikes, um, something that the administration supports uh, in terms of uh, the bill up in Albany, and really thrilled that the council member uh, is going to be um, you know, supporting that bill as well, and I, I believe our, our team, as we all need to write a letter and support that bill. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's the cost of the e-bike, um, you know, I'm, I'm eager to look into an e-bike, I know as much as my daughter chanting, go daddy, go daddy, up that So you know, I think it's, it's providing it's providing a safe network, it's providing um, safe uh, secure bike storage, and it's, it's making sure that these are uh, options that are, are available to to all walks of life members. And one of the first things I, I did at City Hall um, was to work with uh, Senator Schumer, Mark's department, and Mr. Verduzco's to, to secure funding for uh, deliveries to hubs where they can charge their uh, e bikes where they can. Um, the, uh, they can receive city resources and, and connect to, to city resources. The first project that worked on City Hall, I mean, it's not proud of the work on that. We have to know that and to, to, to make sure it's available to everyone. Well, so it's a big word for it. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, yeah, that one, and there's like a couple other old car pre stands that are Yeah, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, one of the benefits of, of leaving and coming back is that think that for a local might seem like subtle change, and you actually notice the starkness of the change. And I have to say, with the proliferation of micro-mobility devices, just electric bikes in, in general, um, we've seen you know just a, a, a uh, you know a much more representative set of folks uh, in my neighborhood in Crown Heights getting around on two wheels, three wheels, uh, etc. And and you know we really want to lift up the fact that. There are tens of thousands of people, you know, making a living now on electric bikes, and we heard from the council member, you know, there's there's this issue in Prospect Park, you know, there's been complaints, so Prospect Park said, you know, no, you know, no, no electric, no motor vehicles on the the drive as a way to sort of, yeah, we did something about the complaints, and it's like, well, what we really meant is the delivery folks and not the families with the electric assist, and then then we're getting into, you know, really being discriminatory. So we've got some, you know, sticky things to, to to navigate as, you know, different variety of vehicles hit the streets. So how's the borough president's office sort of approaching this? Is both kind of an opportunity. We've got the issue with, you know, um, uncertified electric bicycles, you know, and, and it's the risk of fire, uh, the battery issues. So it, it must be coming a lot up in the office. So what's the office up to? It is coming up a lot. I mean, um, I guess a, a, a thing we have to talk about is just like who has political capital and who doesn't. And that somebody with Park Slope can complain about the e bike city that he's got, and that a policy can be put forth by the Department of Transportation to shut it down. 
And that happened in a very short amount of time. In defense of Park Transportation, I think it was a car park. Of course, yeah, right. 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 we got to take it. I actually, I actually love this apartment. Yeah. <laughs> no, they got folks in DOT that are like really, really good. If we just let them loose, it'll be great. But the politics keep them bogged down. And I tell you, if community boards, elected officials, couldn't certify bike lanes or modify things, these guys would run wild. But they can't. The politics don't allow them. I just want to say that I got enough from DOT and the folks that are doing that work on the ground. But it's just the political capital um, and building policy on it versus just doing what's right. And like, we should have a conversation about what is safe in Prospect Park and how we can move through that in a safe way that respects everyone. Have that conversation first and then apply a comprehensive plan as to how you're going to address it. But because the political capital that residents in Park Slope have, especially on Prospect Park, um, the, the influence that they were able to exert to, to have a blanket white policy that they thought would solve the issue. And because they thought that the East Side wouldn't have the political know how or backing to be able to push back against it, that no one would make noise, is what is a big problem. Um, and we've been trying to. We've been trying to the North Side. We want to treat the Department of Transportation. I know this is the Department of Parks, but we want to treat the Department of Transportation the way we treat the NYPD. Council members cannot go to uh, a precinct and say, hey, I don't want you guys you know, doing work on this block. I need all your cops on this block. That could never happen. But with the Department of Transportation, they act like their expertise is like opinion or personal anecdote. Mm -hmm. It's like, this white man doesn't work here. We should take it out. But it's like, why? Who are you? You never gone to school for this. You're not a planner. You have no idea what you're talking about. They do. They literally went to school and have decades of experience as to how to build these networks out. If we start as a city and our politics moving away from allowing for opinions and personal anecdotes to dictate the outcomes of our design, it would make a huge difference for families, for the Middle East side, for these, these moments in Prospect Park where we can shut things down like that. Because it's true. Families take advantage of that. Families are the ones that need the e bikes. I can't. I, am a, I, I feel like I'm pretty healthy in Park. Prospect Park is tough. It's a tough slot going uphill for some <laughs> Can you imagine a family trying to encourage their kids? You're gonna, they're going to have to get off their bike to walk up. Or you can't use your, your e-bike anymore, because specifically because of this policy. And it's discouraging. So again, let's move the politics out of it. This should be treated the same way we treat the NYPD. We don't care about your opinions. We care about the facts. These are facts. <laughs> this is safer to move things like that. Um, so that's a change issue. Yeah. <laughs> and I just like so you're in the same office that Marty Markowitz held. <laughs> <laughs> so I I have post traumatic stress disorder from building a Prospect Park West bike lane yeah. for <laughs> President Marty Markowitz at the end of that street. You have done a good job. You've done a good job, TA, um, street cop. You've done. You, you should be very proud of yourself. The progress we made in politics and transportation issues from you know, ten years ago, fifteen mm -hmm. years ago, has been remarkable. Don't think we haven't made advances. Mm -hmm. Like we're still in the struggle. We're still fighting, but we've advanced significantly. Mm -hmm. And I'm here because of you. You normalize this this conversation. I can say it and be recorded and have no fear about whether or not I'm going to get reelected in four years. And that's not my concern. Right? It's about doing what's right, and I think mm -hmm. that you did that. So, like, give yourself the credit. Mm -hmm. That's not an <laughs>
should have to apply for a school street. I think if you're a school, you should have a school street. So it's a very long process. Um, it's something that starts generally out of the street master plan that was adopted in 2019, I believe. Um, our team, uh, you know, keeps here. Our team works with communities, the community board, the stakeholders to identify particular areas. So it's meant that we're seeing um, data-driven challenges. So the you know high trash areas, high fatality areas, um, and identifying the the, the ways where we can improve the geometric design of the street. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not an engineer, but um, it's essentially just a, a planning process that, that comes generate an idea. You're going to the community, the community stakeholders, the elected officials, to provide feedback on, on what it would look like, and then a year later it would be fixed. So it's a very long process um, that we're always trying to trying to improve upon, but I don't know, you were the, you were the guy that did this more than me, so. <laughs> Walk in New York City, but a year is damn fast for <laughs> compared to around the country. Um, you know, there's really a, uh, as as piecemeal as it can be. Uh, New York City's definitely putting out uh, because of its operational toolkit that it's developed. You know, a lot of these projects you know, faster than in a lot of places. There's a lot of barriers for local governments to um, to, to to get things done right now um, all across the country. There's there's vacancy crisis. You know, it's hard to keep folks on the team. You don't have a great team, or you don't have people to do the work. How, how's the work going to get done? So that's another you know, really important factor. All right, what else do we have from the audience? We've got several questions about the Bergen bike train and cycling education, and cycling is part of education. So, um, how do I get a bike train at my school? Mm. How can cycling become a part of public education, like PE class? curriculum, um, and how can parents get organized, like, 
and the start of Bernie Mike train and Theron school. Uh, I think you just you just do it. Like <laughs> text some parents that are there. Uh, talk to your principal. I think a lot of times principals are really excited to have programs. So not a one-time event, but something that really becomes a part of the fabric of the school, uh, a fabric of the community. And so, you know, like really take that lead. I mean, Chris, you've started it uh, in Greenpoint now for your kids' school. Uh, there are so many people who are interested, and it really just takes that one person to make that connection with other people who want to be part of it, too. Um, and then there is a law in New York that says that cycling education should be part of school curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so be that person making that push. Um, there are so many great programs out there that you can access. Um, hit me up. I'll send a list. I want to um, give a plug to that. Uh, I'm also a teacher, and at the school where I work, um, Bike New York has a great program, and they offer bike mechanics class for after school for um, our students. And I'm always like, I'll volunteer to help out with that class anytime. So that's also, I think I'd love to see that expanded and, and brought into other schools. And I would just add that our assistant commissioner, Kim Rose Joyce, who's in charge of all of our bike education, our coordination with the DOE. Um, we are doubling the number of schools I think that we're in this year um, for uh, the and restoring the bike fleets to seventh graders. Um, so we're, you can learn to ride a bike, you can learn the rules of the road. Uh, and we, just in the preliminary budget, there's an allocation of $74 million for new Safe Routes to School funding, it's capital funding. Um, so it's exciting, it's exciting uh, to see that in the, in the budget, but we're also able to hire a couple more people to do the work and, and double the work. So if you ever want to do that <coughs> at your school or at your child's, child's school, you know, uh, talk to Kim. She's, she's, she's the guru of all those things. Great, thank you. Um, I, there, there are a couple questions that are about um, pedestrians, especially it's about how we can ensure that, especially with bikes and e-bikes, we're ensuring that the most vulnerable users stay protected on the streets, mm -hmm. especially on sidewalks. So, what can I stop on that? Why don't we ask the borough president to talk a little bit? You might hear about pedestrians who, you know, never, why do you sport bikes so much and they're zipping around, not just staying across the street? I, I want to be clear, like, this is not easy. I, I'm from Williamsburg, largely Latino community, we do not get why I love bikes so much. <laughs> so I'm pitching it and selling it every time. My barbershop conversations are intense. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say this, I think uh, another thing we can do, and it's a state issue, is we need to start educating people that a, a bike is closer to a pedestrian than it is a vehicle. Right? And I don't think people know that. And when you do that, uh, cars start uh, respecting, I guess, they, you would hope cars would never get on the sidewalk. We know that's not true, they get on the sidewalks all the time. But, but everyone in New York City can agree that cars on sidewalks are a terrible thing, and it should never happen. When a bike is getting on a sidewalk, they would, they would only do it because it's dangerous. When a car is getting on a sidewalk, they do it for convenience and because they think that they're the work they own the world. A bike is doing it, there's no way you're getting on a sidewalk because you're you're doing it for your safety. You know, going down Bedford Avenue with all those double parked cars, all those car doors open at any random time. It's a very dangerous thing to do. You have to take a lane, a vehicle lane, um, or ride the sidewalk. Those are the only two safe spaces and opportunities you have. And because that infrastructure is not there, um, you end up getting yourself in trouble and riding on, on the sidewalk. But I think both for pedestrians, to educate pedestrians and let them know Look at a cyclist and a bike lane the way you would look at a sidewalk and a pedestrian. And we can build allies in like the pedestrian community, I guess. Mm. Um, and I think it also helps cyclists as well. If they understand, you do not look at yourself like a pedestrian. And we have to do more. We have to do better because there is a culture that just has us zipping through a lot of these streets. I'm guilty of that sometimes. You know, I move around my bike and I can care less about vehicles and I, I purposefully, you know, do what I got to do to keep myself safe and doing so breaks some laws that I don't think help me. Um, but if we had the infrastructure and we educated people, I think we could we could really start having pedestrians be on our side um, in, in, in protecting themselves and, and us. Yeah, I love, I love that. I want to ask Ryan Bill on, on the, the question a little bit. I remember when, um, you know, we're in this, people see the 
the outcome and it might be a DoorDash delivery person going the wrong way or on the sidewalk. And you know, ultimately they're being held accountable by these venture capital funded apps that are saying get someone's food there super fast. And you know, when we before there even were these apps, you know, Kim, we worked on the commercial cycling helmet law. We held a it was restaurants who <laughs> restaurants actually delivered the food for the apps and we held them accountable <laughs> whether they bought a helmet for their cyclists or not. Is there any kind of policy like that, Ryan, that we're kind of building back that we could kind of you know, systemically rather than kind of right at the outcome of, you know, I see an electric moped or a gas moped going the wrong way and I hate these things and let's don't build bike lanes. I know you get that argument. Like well, what can we do policy wise around this issue? We need to build more bike lanes. Um, and we also, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're building more bike lanes. You create the you create the infrastructure so you can you can put the put people in the right rational mode of transportation. Like when we built the Preston Park West bike lane, I, I believe eighty percent of sidewalk riding one way, right? So you build the infrastructure and and people start to use the infrastructure the right way with, with education, signage, everything. Uh, at the same time, you know, we have a burgeoning micro mobility movement in New York City. And it's a good thing for the city. It's a good thing for mobility. We had a great pilot program in the Bronx and East Bronx on, on e scooters. Um, we're looking to expand that program. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we have an interagency micro mobility task force at City Hall that's working on all these issues, whether it's uh, safety, um, enforcement, uh, et cetera. It's all, it's, 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 but it's, we're working together to, to create this regulatory framework that's never really been dealt with before. So um, we're, we have nothing to announce tonight, but like this is, this is something that the city is working on actively to find a way to ensure that we can all use the roads and, and infrastructure in a safe way. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, so this is a question, I guess, for Brian, but um, this may be for you and for the world press, but the question is, given all the benefits that were presented tonight about bike lanes, do you or would it be helpful to go with other agencies, especially DOD, to talk about bike infrastructure? Especially DOD? Yeah, I think they meant Department of Education. Department of Education, okay. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're working very closely with the DOD on a lot of uh, a lot of safe, safe street infrastructure and education. Uh, that's literally the job that Kim has at, at DOT. Um, and we do a lot of work with them. There's, uh, there's, there's education, there's trying to figure out and identify safe, safe environments around the schools um, to continue to build on the success of a lot of the open streets that we've seen during COVID. Um, you know, I think that one of the things we're trying to do mostly, at, at, at a lot of this this year and last year at DOT was really leaning into the pedestrianization of the city. Um, we did that with Trigger Streets. We're doing that with Holiday Streets. We're gonna continue to build on that, um, build, build on our open street successes at Ferry Street, continue to work on that. So uh, there's there's an opportunity to have DOE as a key stakeholder that we're up and build on that relationship, but we're already doing a lot of that work and we want we want to lean into that more. Um, I've got a few questions about enforcement. I'll read from a couple of them. Why are traffic laws not enforced? And in the rare instance they are, why so arbitrarily? Why does NYPD recently traffic and parking laws? Another yeah. related <laughs> question to this and Blake in the panel is the NYPD, which has been unable or unwilling to enforce traffic laws. NYC Council Transportation Committee head has yet to take, <clears throat> take action despite large support from council members. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's a politically messy thing to do, even though I don't think it is. I think people believe 
going after car drivers or just enforcing the law on vehicles is a political landmark. We're not, it, it isn't. Mm -hmm. But enforcement happens with political will. If you had a leader in place that would be willing to ask the NYPD to actually do the enforcement, it will be done. And, it, and we haven't had it. So um, this is not on us, nobody in this panel. You can put somebody in the NYPD, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's at the top top. Uh, Mayor Adams needs to tell NYPD. I love that answer. I, I will say I have seen the the NYPD's response to the PCC, the Precinct Community Councils. I've seen, you know, the Upper East Side ladies go and complain about the delivery drivers since the 90s and the 2000s. Say the delivery bike bikers are on the sidewalk, and then the NYPD's out there giving giving tickets from those mm -hmm. Precinct Community Councils. So, you know, they're still hosting those Precinct Community Councils, and you know. It's almost like it's a mini community board, right? Where people are saying what the top issues in that precinct is, and that can that can kind of shape how a precinct reacts to things. We just need to do it right. We got to be very careful with the community precinct councils. Uh, they do not take well for folks to just come in, have one issue, and make it their priority issue, and try to put resources. I like to be put resources. Talk to Ms. Johnson. Talk to you know the folks that are already there. Do it through them. Have a conversation, see if they buy it, and let them pitch it to the police officers because they've been there for 30 years on the precinct council. They've been there for 25 years and they're well respected. So when you organize, think about the people that are already there mm -hmm. and organize up. Don't organize through. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be very helpful. Another question for the audience. Currently only in Manhattan. Can you grab this in Brooklyn and Queens in 2023? Right here. <laughs> <laughs> I, obviously, I wanted. Um, uh, Donovan Richards, the Queensborough president, and I wrote a joint letter to the Department of Transportation. We are going to be doing some type of input session because we don't know exactly where that street would be uh, because we want it to be long. We want it to be, you know, something that we want to beat Manhattan pretty much. We want to have the longest street in the city. So we will be doing that and presenting it to the Department of Transportation. It showed interest in the conversations I've had. Um, how fast we can get it, you know, this number is only like five months away, four months away. You know, that, that seems like a more normal amount of time for that to happen. Uh, and, and I don't know how long it takes for them to plan it, but we want it. Um, if you guys give us any ideas, we would definitely love to, to, to support it. Yeah, it's something that we're, we're actively, we're actively reviewing internally, and, and you know, so we saw the letter from uh, both of our presidents, and I'll just say that you know we're continuing to. The commissioner every day is telling us that we need to continue to reimagine public space in, this, in the city, and and that's the largest space of public space in the city is our roadways. So um, we're, every day we're, we're tasked with you know, we have to reimagine this public space, and we're looking forward to having this continued conversation with our presidents. Is, uh, is there any specific resource that the Department of Transportation needs to make that happen mm -hmm. outside of? And shutting it down, like it, I just want to know what, what, what you need. So I mean, it's, it's a it's a manpower issue. It's a uh, in terms of you know the work coordinating the NYPD and other agencies in order to, to shut down, uh, open up the street rather, um, for for people. So I, I think it's it, it's it's really just about the, the coordinating piece and having the financial resources to assist that in order to do that. It's not something that's like pre in our budget. So we have to find a way to, to, to coordinate the, all the agencies and all the stakeholders on this to, to make it a reality. But we'd love to continue the conversation. Yeah, I have to say I'm, I'm sort of like hyperventilating thinking about the staff that are already involved with the New York City Marathon and Bike New York and um, all the events and, and you know, the, the demand for Open Street um, and the commitment that the New York City DOT ha team has to do it equitably, which might mean you know, supporting Open Streets events in neighborhoods that don't, their events don't end up on Twitter, or they might not get seen by that mm -hmm. by activists, but there's been such a commitment uh, to equity that these things are, are happening, but you, know, you don't want to just close the street and then create enemies. There's all, all the programming that you want to have to go with it, because it is a tremendous opportunity, but you need to know, like, what, what, what will land in that community. If it's cultural programming, what kind of cultural programming? 
Yeah, um, is, it, is it physical activity program? What kind of physical activity program works in, in those communities? The last thing we want is to like stamp, you know, a plain vanilla Park Avenue's summer streets on, uh, you know, a, a, a neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, do, how are we doing on time? Are we ready for the lightning round? Or a couple more audience questions? One more question. All right. Okay. Family question. Um, what would you tell the seven year old child who wants to ride a bike or jump on the back of a parent's bike? Let's, let's, start, let's, let's start with our non elected officials giving, giving some advice and peer, peer advice. So we'll start with you, Emily. Uh, I always say just do it. Someone has to. I mean, I've been asked this question by colleagues, and I say, like, somebody has to be the person that's going to do it. Uh, so go for it. Um, I mean, I'm fortunate that I learned to ride a bike when I was a kid, so I was able to teach my kids in the parks. Um, but I think I would point to learn to ride programs for kids and for, for adults um, as a way to learn because not everybody has that opportunity to spend time with their family members. Yes. Any, any advice you give? I, I'm, I'm losing the fight at home, yeah. so I don't have to advise. Well, I'll give you some after, advice. After today, I feel like I'm better prepared. To take time. <laughs> so, how about starting on Sunday morning when everyone's asleep? So, time of day is a strategy to start to build your comfort. Um, My school is four blocks away, and I'm petrified. I, I, I think we can figure it He's on a scooter right now, it's on the sidewalk. Um, to get him on a bike on the street, yeah, I got to say no. So, I have no advice. Take care, take care. <laughs> Just do it. Yeah. If I do it, I'll put it on Twitter and I'll start. You gotta find a friend. You know? Ryan, I think leaning into, leaning into the open spaces that we have, like open streets, um, it's a great opportunity to, to get out there and just sort of rough ride around. I know I always see uh, during the marathon, people going out on 4th Avenue and just riding down, the, down 4th Avenue before the runners come. It's a great opportunity to just sort of Teach your kids how to ride bikes. It's fun for you. And, and to actually tell them, just do it. It's fun. Do it on the sidewalk. You know, just your kids. Ride on the sidewalk and figure it out. It's fun. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have um, just a few final lightning round questions. Um, so one or two words. I'll ask the question. Answer, 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 answer. And we'll go to the next question. You ready? Ready. Okay. Best street in Brooklyn to ride on? Bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Come back. <laughs> I'm, I'm agreeing with what's going I'm going to go Flatbush between the park and the town guard. Thanks to Papa. <laughs> nice. Possibly Park West. Possibly Park West. All right. Uh, Meetings or clubs? Clubs. 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 Ooh. I'm, I'm going to make you one of those. <laughs> All right. Parking inside or outside? Yeah. Outside. Three stolen bikes. Outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's a combo. Inside and outside. Okay. All right. The age when your child will be, was, or would be allowed to ride alone mm. in Brooklyn. Mm. <laughs> would you let the child? Like to, here's the 11 year old rides a bus. You know, I think you were like 11, you let your kid ride transit to school. Mm -hmm. what, what age would we let your child? Right now. I think fourth grade, that's when they can walk to school. Fifth grade. Maybe 16. <laughs> <laughs> Middle school, so yeah. seventh grade? Sixth grade, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I say sixth grade. All right. Okay. You're biking with kids, they're on their own bike. You bike in front of them, in back of them, or alongside of them. That's everybody. What's the answer, Hilda? It depends. But I guess it depends. Beside them, box them in. Box them in. Specifically in front or beside. Yeah. So I always go. I always go kind of to from the back and then off to the left. Like an angle. Like seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Seven o'clock. Got it. Awesome. All right. The top season for biking. Multiple choice. <laughs> Fall, winter, spring, summer. <laughs> e. All seasons. Oh. Oh.
now I'm teaching material here. Oh, come on. Kind of like New York in the fall. Fall is good, you don't sweat as much. Yeah. I'll go with fall too. All right. Okay. Our last um, lightning round question the favorite place to bike to in Brooklyn? Brooklyn's so filled with amazing places. Where do you love to be? It's a nice spring day. Where would you love to go on a bike ride? To? Restaurant, park, uh, point of interest? Okay. All right. I really love um, Shirley Chicken Park. And yeah. 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 Something about Prospect Park. It, it just anything in Prospect Park is awesome. Wherever my kids are playing soccer. So. <laughs> <laughs> anything? Okay. Um, I really like biking through the Brooklyn Bridge Park. It feels like a real forest. Mm -hmm. I, I want to use Brooklyn Bridge Park. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone Coney Islands? Yeah. Coney Island is Coney Island is awesome, but there's a lot of bumps on the road here. Uh, you gotta really traverse. Uh, yeah. Coney Island is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta go no take Parkway bike path. It's a lot of work. <laughs>